All right, well, we're going live here, and uh, hopefully we're going to get some people signing on for our absolutism uh, live hangout, tutoring session, whatever it is that you want to call it. Um, but uh, this is going to make it so that, you know, you have, uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions and you have the opportunity to learn a little bit about absolutism and constitutionalism. So sort of uh, wait for a few people to jump on. We've got uh, three, five. Good. We're, we're kicking up pretty quickly. Um, all right. Autumn, glad to hear that, that uh, the videos are helping. I, I'm going to be making more. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that these are things that are really like really going to help and that are really going to sort of uh, help you do well on the AP exam, which is really, you know, the big thing. I mean, obviously learning a little bit about history is a wonderful thing, but, uh, but in the end, if you learn lots of history, but you don't do well on the AP exam, then, you know, it's, it seems like a waste at least, although I'm kind of a big fan of learning just for the sake of learning. All right, Amanda, first time watcher. Good, good. My teacher recommended this. Who's the teacher, actually? I'd love to know who out there is uh, is recommending these things and, and what they're saying about them because, you know, this is sort of something new that I'm trying this year and, and it's, you know, I don't know. This is, what, the third, fourth time that we've done it and, uh, and it's going to be a weekly thing something that you can look forward to, something that you can dread. I don't know. Um, it depends on what you're into. But if you uh, but if you like this and it helps, then I think it'll be a wonderful thing for everybody to, to be able to go on and, and, and get a little bit of sort of questions answered and live tutoring and all of that. So, uh, you know, let me know where you're from and uh, what your questions are and all that. So, uh, all right, Indianapolis, Indiana. That's awesome. And it's wonderful to see that, that people are getting the word here about this. Um, but anyway, we're here to talk about uh, the age of absolutism and uh, constitutionalism. And really just to sort of give you an overview of how things are going to, how I like to run things. Um, I can sit here and chat forever about this stuff and turn it into like this very boring kind of, you know, uh, uh, broadcast. But I like to respond to the questions that you have. So basically, we're talking about absolutism, excuse me, it's been a long day, um, and constitutionalism. We're talking about this time of divine right monarchy. Um, and uh, you have these rise up all over the continent of Europe. Um, and you have the uh, you have this sort of uh, failure of absolutism that happens in places like the Dutch Republic, which is you know named a republic because it's not a monarchy, um, and the failure of the monarchy to become absolutist in England and causes civil war and an eventual glorious revolution, which brings back a king, but they're not an absolute king, so all of that. So we got someone from St. Augustine. Absolutely love St. Augustine. Went there uh, two summers ago. And, you know, if you want to see some really bad videos about St. Augustine, um, go on my YouTube page and, and click on, uh, there's a playlist called like uh, uh, History Travels or something like that. I forget what I called it. But uh, yeah, I did a couple of St. Augustine videos, one at the Fountain of Youth and one at the... Um, at the fort there, um, and the name's escaping me of the fort. Anyway, so getting into absolutism. So the big idea behind absolutism is this is sort of like, a, you know, a, a progression. It's a progression of power that's centralized. It starts with these new new monarchs that arise during the uh, during the Renaissance, who are really starting to gain power at the expense of the, the nobles who have had power throughout the Middle Ages. And so, you know, they're, they're finding new ways to kind of take power away from the nobles and consolidate power in the king and, and or queen. Um, and absolutism is an extension of that. In fact, it's also an extension of the Machiavellian idea of what princes should do and what good monarchs should do in order to maintain control of their societies. So it's all kind of intertwined as you go through. 
What they're also finding though is that strong centralized monarchies are able to do things like raise taxes, maintain armies, build big uh, structures, and maintain real control, especially using taxation and things like that, in order to uh, unify their countries. And so the ones that follow an absolutist monarchy model tend to be stronger and tend to be able to access more resources and become much more powerful. And let's face it, if you're a monarch at the time and you want like absolute control, absolute monarchy is the way to go. It, it's very quick to react to things. It, it's, uh, you know, it, it, like you have, don't really have to listen to what the people have to say. You kind of make your own destiny. Um, which can lead to some bad things, but it also can lead to some very great, great things. So, um, so yeah, so we, we're going to look at a few different uh, options here, but again, we have a chat window here on the side. So if you have any questions, comments, shout outs, you'd like me to give anything like that, please let me know. Um, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, now I should say right off the bat, we're gonna put a one hour time limit on this. And this is because I teach AP uh, European history, but I also teach AP government. And at nine o'clock, the vice presidential debate is coming on. So I'm gonna sign off, I'm gonna go watch that. And, uh, and then maybe, just maybe, if I still have energy, do a little periscope session after the vice presidential debate. So, you know, if you, if you have periscope and you wanna see if I, if I hop on, um, and the uh, my name is P Sergeant on there. So um, anyway, with the absolute monarchs, like the big idea is these guys are consolidating power and they're using taxation in order to uh, in order to raise the money to be able to do this. They are also taking away power from the nobles largely by trying to incorporate them in a way into what's going on. And when they incorporate them into what's going on, then they do it in a way which makes them, which makes them the, the nobles have less power over their areas. The greatest example of this is Louis XIV. Okay, Louis XIV in France is like the poster child for absolutism. Because what he does is he creates this massive complex in, in Versailles. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there, but this place is absolutely magnificent i mean decorated it, it's, it's unbelievable there's 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 gardens there's a, i mean i mean the, the the place is huge there's the infamous hall of mirrors which <laughs> there's a whole lot of things that happen in the hall of mirrors um but it's all designed to kind of give the idea that louis the 14th is the sun king as he called himself, like the the overall ruler of all of this and he requires all of the nobles in order to maintain their noble status to spend a great deal of the year at versailles so they're not out at their home areas administrate administering you know their their local uh, peasants like they have traditionally done. So he sends out bureaucrats, people who work for him, middle class accountants, lawyers, stuff like that, to go out and administer, which gives them power. They're loyal to him. And he traps the, the nobility into like this sort of incestuous kind of kind of uh, uh, culture inside of Versailles, where they they uh, catered his every single whim. I mean, it's like an honor to be the one to help dress him in the morning if you're a noble, which is not what you think nobles would really think was be a great honor, but they did. And he's able to pull them all in and thus completely incapacitate their ability to challenge his rule because they're spending all their time fighting over who gets to do these little things for Louis XIV. Um, so Dylan, yeah, learning about the Reformation and the New World in AP Euro, um, but uh, but hey, I'll learn some more. You'll be coming up on this, um, and if you want to see back, uh, I mean, certainly I have lots of videos about this. If you go to my website, sergeantnotes.com, and you go to one of the uh, you go to one of those pages, videos that I've created, videos that I've linked from other classes or from other uh, people including Tom Ritchie and Crash Course and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, those will those will kick in with Reformation and all that. And you can even see the live stream that I did about the Reformation, um, what, a couple weeks ago, I guess it was. Um, so those are all out there for you. Um, so yeah, Louis the Fourteenth is like the poster child for this, and he's doing all of this, and it's like doing things in order to kind of like show off his power. Versailles itself is not enough, but so he goes and he actually has. I love this. He has orange trees in Paris now. Or Paris, if you've been there, this is not like Florida. This is not orange growing country, but what he does is he creates a massive green greenhouse with hundreds of orange trees and they're all in these planters that have wheels on the bottom of them and so he keeps them a well he his people who are tending to all of this they keep the orange trees in the greenhouse when it's warm and sunny they wheel them all outside i mean it's hundreds of trees they get sunlight they grow oranges and whatnot and he becomes the only monarch in europe who's able to serve oranges that are freshly picked off his trees in France to those people who are coming to, to, uh, to hang out. I mean, that is complete power. Plus, he creates all of these, he creates, he has people make it, right? But creates all of these sort of intricate, uh, uh, sort of like uh, bush mazes, like, like you know, shrubbery mazes, mazes in the backyard of Versailles, which have these little hidden hiding places and meeting places and all of that, because he knows that these nobles are going to, like, they're not going to have much to do, so they're going to get involved in all kinds of trouble. And he has a series of secret spies that go around and their job is to know everything there is to know about every one of the nobles at Versailles, like so that he has dirt on everybody. So if they come to him and they want to start complaining, not only can he take away their nobility, not only can he completely just, just demolish them, but he's got secrets on them that he can use, which can ruin their marriages. So like, I mean, it is the absolutely flawless plan. Now, I'm not saying Louis XIV is flawless because he does have his flaws and they become very obvious late in his reign here. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we can get into that. So Rory, yeah, your teacher recommended this too. That's great. Um, let me know who your teacher is and, and, and all of that so I can, I can give him a thanks. Uh, we have a Mr. Riney. Um, and, uh, and, and LJ, thank you for the comment. I, I saved your life is probably a little bit too much, but, uh, but I appreciate the sentiment there. You know, I'm just sitting here talking in front of a camera and, you know, making things kind of happen. So as the absolute, ab as the absolutist model goes with Louis the 14th, like he's the poster child, all of these monarchs around Europe start to adopt it. And it's based on the ideas of really two things. Number one is the idea of a divine right monarchy. Now under the theory of divine right monarchy, and please keep in mind, the Europeans, the, the long, long history, you have an intellectual or a series of intellectuals write the theory behind something and then you put it into practice. So, um, so the divine right monarchy basically works off the idea that God has placed this monarch and this, and this family into power. And so therefore the monarchs don't have to answer to anybody, but God, no one can question their ad. No one can question what they do because God has placed them there. And, you know, I mean, the logic is there. If God hadn't placed them there, they wouldn't be there because God's all powerful. Boom. Right? So there you go. Um, so, uh, oh, hey, Fry. Fry Films. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I recommended my videos. Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it. Charity, I can always count on you. You know that. Um, Anya, I'm glad that you're enjoying these videos. I'm glad they're helping out. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's like the model of absolutism is it's divine right theory. Um, and, and it governs everything that goes on. So you have these monarchies that pop up, um, all over the place and they introduce like the new 
dynasties that are going to be around for a long time. When I say dynasties, what I mean are these ruling families, and they're going to pass rule down from generation to generation, and they're going to work together to consolidate power so that they remain in power. So knowing the names and knowing the dynasties is really kind of something that's really hard to get your, your, your head around. So here's sort of the quick and dirty of it all. In France, you have the Bourbon monarchy. It starts with Henry IV. This is the guy who issued the Edict of Nantes. This is the guy who won the War of Three Henrys during the religious wars. This is the guy who changed from uh, Calvinism to Catholicism to save uh, France and become its king. He starts the Bourbon monarchy. The Bourbon monarchy will stay in France until the French Revolution, when they cut off Louis XVI's head. And then it'll come back, then it'll go away, and it'll kind of come back and then it'll go away and then it's gone. Um, so the Bourbon monarchy is, is the French monarchy. Um, you have the rise of Prussia, which becomes, it's one of the, the independent states, one of the larger independent states of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and after the Treaty of Westphalia, which gives them their autonomy, the, the Prussian state, which is really confusing because it, it's a lot like, sounds like a lot like the Russian state, and it doesn't exist anymore. Well, today it's called Germany, but, you know, it doesn't really exist as Prussia anymore. They're ruled by a family called the Hohenzollern family. Um, now, first names play into this, all right? Um, the Bourbons, they love naming their kids Louis. If you see a king named Louis, I'm telling you, the guy's French, okay? Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Prussians, they love naming their monarchs Frederick or Frederick William. So you can kind of stick with that. Um, then you have the Habsburgs, you have the Spanish Habsburgs and you have the Austrian Habsburgs. Um, the Spanish Habsburgs, they are in Spain. Um, and they love naming their monarchs Philip. So nice and easy. If you see Philip, it's probably a Spanish guy. Um, and then you have the Austrian Habsburgs who name their kids like all kinds of things. So Ferdinand is a big one. Joseph is a big one, you know, but, uh, but usually when they have a Habsburg Austrian monarch, they'll say like of Austria or they'll throw Habsburg on the end of it. Um, now, Nathan Lamas is here from uh, Mr. Knight's class in Corona, California. Used to spend a lot of time in Corona, California, and you know, sort of that Inland Empire right there. I, I loved it. My brother-in-law and, and sister-in-law lived there back when I lived in San Diego, so we would go up and visit them all the time. So, uh, hey, it's a neat place. I like it. Didn't like it as much as San Diego because you know there was the beach and all that, but. It's okay, whatever. Anyway, so uh, so you have the rise of those. In Russia, you have the rise of the Romanov dynasty. And like your big guy for the Romanov dynasty is Peter the Great. Now, you know you're doing well when you're a king if you're called the Great and it kind of sticks. So Peter the Great is the one who really consolidates power as much as you can in Eastern Europe. It gets harder to do as you move farther east, but he does a pretty good job. He tries to westernize Russia and to kind of make it more uh, Western European, including imposing things like uh, dress codes. And when he when he uh, you know sets up the city of St. Petersburg, he even bans beards and like like he makes uh, nobles shave their beards off when they're coming into St. Petersburg so that they will be more Western because Westerners weren't really wearing beards all that much. You know, they were wearing high heels and pantyhose. Hose, not pantyhose, but hose, you know? So, uh, so yeah. So all this is all about consolidation of power. Um, now this is attempted in England and England provides like the example, well, there's a couple of examples, but England is the best example of where this absolutely fails because England tries to implement this under James I and Charles I, who take over as the Stuart monarchs after the death of Elizabeth. If you remember, Elizabeth I dies with no heir because she never got married and she never had kids, at least not that we know of. And, um, and so when she died, 
like there's no direct heir. So uh, Parliament goes up the old family tree and they find that the closest, the, uh, the closest uh, uh, relative that's living is the son of Mary Queen of Scots who Elizabeth had executed. Anyway, he is the Scottish king. Now, in Scotland, he's known as James the Sixth because he is the sixth James, the sixth James, to be the king of Scotland. And so Parliament offers him the throne. When he comes down, he accepts it. He comes down to London, he becomes uh, the king of England. He's the first James to become king of England. So he's like James the Sixth and James the First at the same time. Um, he tries to institute divine right monarchy and an absolute monarchy and all of that. Um, and uh, he runs into the problem that English monarchs have, which is parliament. Now keep in mind, in most of these places, like in France, Louis XIV never calls parliament. Like he just doesn't. He's like, no, I don't want to meet with you guys. I'm the absolute ruler. You're going to live at Versailles. You're going to do what I tell you to do and that's it. Um, but, uh, but, uh, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so so James tries to call in Parliament, and especially as he's starting to have to deal with warfare and things like that, he needs money, Parliament is in charge of giving out money, so he asks them for it. They say, hey, we'd love to give you money. However, we're gonna have to ask for something else. We're gonna have to ask you to sign this petition of right, which says that there are certain things that the, that the English king can't do to us nobles. Well, he just says, no, I'm good, go away. And he dismisses Parliament. And he basically rules for the rest of his rule without Parliament. He dies. His son, Charles, takes the throne. Charles is never supposed to take the throne. He had an older brother. His older brother being totally groomed to take the throne. Charles was not really even that good at, at you know, being king and all of that, as is evidenced by what I'm about to tell you. So he takes the throne and uh, he immediately comes into real conflict with Parliament. There's an invasion from Scotland. There is a, um, a he's got, he's got these, these, like the wars are brewing on the continent. The Thirty Years' War is being, is being fought. And there's all kinds of conflicts. He needs money. So he calls Parliament. He asks them for money. They say no. He says, go away, you know. And it becomes an escalating conflict between the two. And ultimately, as, and, and, and there's a religious aspect too to this, because he's starting to implement things in the, in the Anglican, the English church, which are more Catholic. Um, he's trying to go back to sort of the, the English church of Henry VIII, rather than sort of the moderate English church of Elizabeth the first and so he tries to put some of these things into play and the the Parliament is really ruled by these people who are called Puritans Puritans are Calvinist in their English Calvinists they want nothing they want no decoration they want no like Saints they want you know no stained glass windows and boy, they, they, they don't even really want you to dance, sing, drink, gamble. Like, I mean, anything will put a smile on someone's face, unless it's like you smiling because you're worshiping God, like they want to get rid of it. And so it comes to a head and they end up fighting a civil war. Now the King's forces are strong, but the forces of parliament are led by a guy named Oliver Cromwell and Oliver Cromwell creates um, what's called the New Model Army. And the New Model Army is like, not only is it very organized, but it's very, very, very devoutly religious based. So they go into, into battle and they're singing like, like Christian religious hymns, like onward Christian soldiers and all of this. And you'd be surprised what this does to the morale of an army. And they become very, very successful. They win the war and end up deciding through Parliament to cut off the head of the king. Well, now they've executed the monarch. So divine right monarchy failed in Europe. I mean, in, uh, sorry, in England. And so Cromwell takes over. Now here's what's ironic about Cromwell. He then comes to Parliament. He asks them to do some things. They say no. He says, well, you know what? I can rule without you. Does this sound familiar? 
and he starts to rule without parliament and gets sort of like this uh, this this whole thing going. He goes on campaigns against different uh, different areas, um, most notably and most notoriously, he goes on a very bloody campaign against the Catholics in Ireland and is still like hated in Ireland to this day for having done this. Um, and, uh, and, and absolutely puts this down in the most brutal fashion possible. Um, but he is ruling as an absolute monarch. He's doing it because he has an army that no one can beat. When he dies, he names his son his successor. Again, are we sounding a little bit familiar here? He names his son his, his successor. His son is not Oliver Cromwell. And so uh, Parliament says, yeah, this isn't working. We need to bring back the monarchs that were in charge before, the Stuart family. So they bring back Charles's son, James, uh, Charles II. All right. And Charles II is like, he's this guy who is not like this big kingly kind of guy. He just enjoys life. Absolutely. I'm going to talk about Prussia in one second, so I'll get there. Um, so he, he brings back, um, uh, he brings back like, like, I mean, they, they outlawed celebrating Christmas and all kinds of stuff. So he brings all that back games, gambling, drinking parties, Christmas, all of that. He has all kinds of affairs. He has illegitimate children all over the place and people love it. And why do they love it? Because they spent 10 years under a Puritan regime. And Puritanism is like, um, real well, people like to describe it as the, the sort of overwhelming fear that someone somewhere is having a good time. So, yeah. <laughs> You've heard of Puritan Massachusetts? Yeah. Mm, Salem's Childs, everyone wearing like the buckle shoes and the black and the white. and Yeah. It's not all about having a good time. Vegas would not be like their main place to go. Of course, at that time, they would have a hard time getting there. There was nothing in Vegas and all of that. So Gabby is on and able to comment. Somehow my students have a, have a hard time like the, the getting on because of uh, because of firewall issues. But Gabby's on now, so that's good. Okay, so if we're talking about Prussia, all right, so jumping over to Prussia. Now, Prussia is a new player on the, uh, on, the, uh, on, on the stage here. And Prussia's rise comes because they really are focusing on the military. And it's that Prussian militarism, which is going to be a theme that you're going to see from the rise of Prussia in the 17th century all the way through its creation of a German state in 1870. Um, and then, of course, you know, the German, uh, you know, military issues and conquests and all of that that go well into the 20th century. It's a very militarized culture. Um, and, uh, and, and so the rise of Prussia is largely built upon that. It's the consolidation of what was an elector of the Holy Roman Empire into a ruler of a state, which then starts to buy which then starts to compete really with Austria, with the Austrian Habsburgs for control of these, all these little independent states, which are created when the Peace of Westphalia breaks up the Holy Roman Empire. Um, they get into some weird things like, you know, they toy around with the idea that, that really tall soldiers will make a better army. Fairly successful with that. But the idea here is you're sort of engaging in constant warfare with with standing armies that have um, that, that 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 are funded by taxation, and all of these wars are being well, many of them are being propagated by Louis the Fourteenth, who is really kind of like like running the whole thing. You know, he's the guy who's in charge of it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, Prussia is like just coming onto the stage here, and Prussia is just sort of starting to make its um, its uh, its entrance here. So at this point, that's really kind of Prussia. Prussia has become much bigger; they're a big player. And in fact, this is the time where you see the rise of those East Central and Eastern European powers, 
um, of, 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 you know, the, 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 the Habsburg Austrians, um, the Prussians, these people are really sort of um, uh, driving up. Um, so Gabrielle, out of all the English rulers, which was the most important, significant in your opinion? I'm hoping that you're asking about the absolutist English rulers, because all English rulers, I would really be, you know, that'd be a tough question. Um, the most important and significant. Well, um, I, I, I think, and I, I'm going to say this over and over throughout these, like you guys have in this course, a course outline. It's available on my website. If you haven't seen it, go to my website, click on AP European history, and then there's course outline there and you can go through or curriculum outline. I think I have it. Um, you can go through there and see exactly what it is that you're supposed to know, including every single name, every single, all of that. You can also go to individual pages on my website. Um, and really I would focus on the ones in period one for right now because it's a work in progress, but I've created study guides that align with chapters in our, uh, textbook. This is the Spielvogel textbook. Um, but they could be used with other things, but they're taken directly from the curriculum outline. Like, like here's who you should know and here's what you should do. And, and I encourage my students or I ask my students to create flashcards for all of like the, the, the people in the events that are named in here. Um, so of the English rulers, and I'm going to have to just go to the, uh, you know, go to the reference guide here of the English rulers that are in this period. Um, there is really, okay. So there's not a single English ruler that's named as an actual, like this person's name really could, uh, uh, show up on the AP exam. However, they have what are called examples. And these are people who you should know, at least some of them, in order to use them for examples in, say, like your uh, LEQs, your long essay question, your short answer questions, or your document based questions. And um, let's see, they name James the First, Charles the First, and Oliver Cromwell. Of those, who's most important? Um, Hmm. That's a tough one. You know, they all did something. I mean, James, James the first was, you know, you sort of like, uh, got the absolutist thing started very well known because he's the one who commissioned the writing of the, of the King James Bible, created a committee to translate the Bible. And it's still sort of like, like the Bible that a lot of traditionalists like, you know, we like the these and thous, I guess, that are a little bit more than uh, than some of the more, uh, uh, you know, um, conversational Bibles, which which are printed. Um, but uh, but Charles the First is the one who causes the conflict of the Civil War and ends up getting his head cut off. I guess that's significant. Um, and Oliver Cromwell, very significant because he is like this tiny little period in English history where England is a commonwealth and not a monarchy. Um, but of course, they realize that that didn't work so well and they go right back to monarchy. So, yeesh, most important, most significant, I think, I think those three really are uh, very significant. When did Russia turn into absolutism? Okay, so Russian absolutism really comes along with Peter the Great. Um, and Peter the Great is going to try and consolidate power. Now, he's going to be less successful than Louis XIV because, um, well, A, Russia is just, it's huge. It's massive. And so in order to try and exert control in a time where transportation is really difficult is, well, really difficult. And so he has to give them certain concessions. And so the, you have this weird thing where there's like an increasing freedom of the peasants that's going on in Western Europe, but in places like Eastern Europe and in Russia, they actually make serfdom, which is this sort of like medieval concept that, that peasants are tied to the land. They actually make that more strict and they give the lords that oversee the peasants almost life and death control over their serfs. And Peter does this in order to get the backing of the nobles. And here's the reason why he needs it. In Western Europe, there is a rising middle class that has money. 
and the and and uh, monarchs like Louis the Fourteenth and like Philip and you know, these monarchs in Western Europe, they can use the middle class in order to sort of wedge them into a place where they are able to to take away power from the nobles. If you need money, well, you don't need the nobles if you have very wealthy uh, artisans and middle class. But that doesn't exist in Russia. And so in, in, in Russia, Poland, um, uh, to an extent, Prussia, the Austrian, uh, the Austrian lands, um, they have to kind of play a little bit more of a delicate game than sort of just telling the nobles, you got to come live in Versailles and do everything I tell you to do. So um, that would be Russian absolutism there. So Gabby was absolute was absolutism an effective way to rule, or did it ultimately fail? Well, ultimately it failed because you know we don't have absolute rulers today, really. Unless you go to North Korea, he's kind of absolute. Sorry. Um, but it was very effective at the time, and it was especially effective in France because it creates this like massively powerful monarchy in France, which is able to, to maintain control. In fact, the French monarchy is so in control of things that France becomes the center of culture. It becomes the language of diplomacy. It becomes like the model for how all of the monarchs, like they all compare themselves to Louis the 14th. Um, and it's done through taxation. So get this. At its peak, Louis XIV's court at Versailles takes about 60% of the entire treasury of France in order to maintain itself. Constantly throwing parties, big lavish balls, housing all of the nobility of France. I mean, these things cost money. And if you're a noble and you're going to go and move to Versailles, you're going to be expected to, treat, to, to be treated very well, and they are, so 60%. Now that number's even gonna go up under Louis the 15th and up under Louis the 16th and uh, you know Marie Antoinette, who really, really knows how to spend money. But that's a story for another time. Um, so it was effective. Now the question is, was it like a good way to rule? And under our modern American interpretation of good, no. It was horrible. And the reason is because absolute monarchs, absolute monarchs under divine right theory don't have to answer to the people in any way whatsoever. They simply tell people what to do and that's it. If they decide to go to war, they go to war if, and everybody kind of does it. Um, and that's not how we want things to happen in this day and age. We don't want one person to tell us that that he is the answer to all of our nation's problems. So if we just give him complete control, then everything will be great. I think I just crossed a line there. But anyway, we'll just keep going. So yeah, so it was very effective. It was very effective in the West. In the East, in Eastern Europe, again, it was much less effective. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that kind of answers that question. Um, absolutism has its beginnings really, um, and, and, it, and, and it marks a change with the 30 years war. Now, now in the, this course, 1648 is one of the three turning points that's, that's created, um, and, uh, or set aside by the college board. And the reason is this. Prior to 1648, so much of European life is driven by religion. And especially when the Protestant Reformation begins, religion becomes the basis for warfare uh, throughout this. During the Thirty Years' War, especially at the end, really kind of set up by a French cardinal who is a member of the Roman Catholic Church, you have a Catholic country that fights against the Austrian Habsburgs, who are a Roman Catholic country fighting against them and siding with Protestant uh, countries 
that are fighting against them. And, and, and then the reason is because dynastic and national security and power has become more important than religious issues. Although, of course, you know, Louis the Thirteenth will go out and he'll, if you recall the Edict of Nantes, which was which was passed by his father, Henry IV, to give uh, freedom of religion to the Huguenots, Louis the Thirteenth goes and, and uh, abolishes that um, with the Edict of Fontainebleau, which says like, yeah, no, we're not going to do this anymore. You can't have a unified country with a divided religious base because religious bases are the like the foundation of conflict at this time. So Mrs. Raspberry recommended this from Birmingham, Alabama. Boy, I've got Alabama, Indiana. I've got California. I've got this is awesome. And, and a couple of schools in IB. Um, Autumn, I, I missed your, uh, your uh, comment there. Um, IB, uh, what are we talking? Are you talking Imperial Beach? Like down in Southern, 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 Southern California. Literally Imperial Beach sits on the Mexican border. It is, uh, it's way, 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 way down there. Um, so I'm glad that I'm hearing that people are recommending this stuff. Um, so, uh, so what other questions do you have about this, uh, about absolutism? Um, and I guess I haven't even really talked about constitutionalism. So if, uh, we can certainly get into constitutionalism if you want me to talk about that. But I feel I'm kind of like going off about all of this. Um, all right. The test is tomorrow, Gabrielle. You want... Yes, you want me to talk about constitutionalism, I'm assuming. So, okay. So, uh, this goes back to England. And uh, the Dutch have a constitutional thing going on. They're a republic, and republics tend to thrive on constitutions. But England is like the big thing that comes out of this. So, um, I've told you the story of, of the Stuarts, of uh, James I and Charles I. I've told you about uh, Oliver Cromwell. I've told you about the resurgence of the Stuarts under Charles II. His brother, James II, follows him. James II is a very Catholic guy who marries a French Catholic queen, Eh, Parliament's not all too worried about that. They really, you know, they kind of got things set up. His sister is set to take the throne after him. She's married to a Protestant Dutch guy named uh, William of Orange. So, like, everything's fine. Plus, hey, you know, James II, or, or sorry, Charles II, wait, no, James II. I get confused. Um, James II has no male heir. He's got a daughter, but yeah, no, we're going to move on. Um, so everything's fine and good until all of a sudden he has a son. Now there's a little bit of controversy over this and people still argue that there, they didn't really have a son, that basically a child was kind of smuggled in and passed off as his son. But anyway, Parliament kind of freaked out because Parliament looked around. They're mostly Puritan. They're looking and saying, wait a minute now. Okay, we're trying to keep this country Protestant. Now we've got a Catholic king that we really, you know, we're, okay. But now he's got an heir. And this could be really, really bad. And so they invite um, Mary, the sister of Charles, to, uh, or sister of James, sorry to come over and take the throne, along with a Dutch army led by her husband, William of Orange. So William and Mary invade uh, England, and in an almost bloodless revolution, they win. And Parliament offers them the throne under the condition that they will sign the English Bill of Rights. And under the English Bill of Rights, they put limits on what the monarchy is able to do. And thus, it establishes a constitutional monarchy which divides power between parliament and the king. And is very clear about things that parliament can do and the king simply can't do because he wants to. Absolute uh, rule and divine right rule is gone in England. 
And it's going to gradually erode over time to the point that today the English monarch, Elizabeth II, is really more of a figurehead than an actual political figure. She performs the, the, the job of the head of, of, um, of the country. Um, uh, in other words, she's going to go to like diplomatic functions and she's going to host uh, visiting uh, uh, kings, queens, presidents, wh whatever. But the prime minister is the head of government and really is kind of running the show here. Um, so parliament is in charge. All right, so Louis the Fourteenth. Yes, so late in Louis the Fourteenth's life, he begins to fight a series of wars. He's sort of gotten a good army together. He's gotten all of this together, and he's looking for opportunities to really make his um, his uh, uh, country and his dynasty stronger than ever. He fights a series of wars, and really, what they do, you don't need to know. Again, I'm just going to double check my, uh, my my curriculum guideline here to make sure that I'm saying the right thing. Um, you don't need to know any of the specific wars at all. They won't ask you about any of them. But um, the one significant war there that, that is his final war is the War of Spanish Succession, in which he, you know, the Spanish monarch dies. The uh, uh, his uh, nephew, I believe it is, Louis XIV's nephew, has claimed the Spanish throne, so he tries to get him on there. The rest of Europe kind of says, no, this is a bad idea. We don't want Bourbons on the throne of France and Spain. We want, because that just, that's too strong. And it, no, 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 we won't. We, no, we don't want to drop into another huge war like the Thirty Years' War. So there creates around uh, around his opponents a grand alliance, which allies itself against France to stop him from doing this. Well, ultimately, when the war is over, the grand alliance is going to win, and they're going to put restrictions on all of this. Now they do let the Bourbon go on to the throne of Spain but they put in safeguards in the treaty, which basically say like, hey, you know, you can't consolidate the powers of France and Spain, and you can't make this into like one big thing, or otherwise we're all gonna rise up here and we're gonna take you on in the battlefield. Um, and, uh, and so it serves to consolidate and bring together opposition to the idea of a dominant power in Europe. And so this concept of a, balance of power really starts to take shape, where if you have one country which gains too much power, then you, uh, then the other countries will be there to kind of bring them back down. And it's going to be a theme you're going to see, like rule international diplomacy in Europe throughout the rest of, well, throughout the 18th, the 19th, and, and, and well, the 20th centuries. Um, is this idea of balance of power that 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 at least have offsetting uh, groups or offsetting countries that can that can prevent one another from starting a war? When he died, Louis the Fourteenth's great regret is that he loved war a bit too much. He liked his armies. He liked to win. He liked to uh, to do this. Um, and and you know. It, it was a bit of a downfall because these things cost a lot of money. And so they, they, they really put France into a bad financial situation. And between the wars and the extravagant lifestyle of, um, of, of the court at Versailles, Louis XIV, who is revered in many ways for sort of being the most powerful French king, is has this complicated legacy that he almost bankrupted the entire French state, but it survives. And, and Louis the 15th will continue the court and Louis the 16th will com continue the court, but he's really going to bankrupt the state of France. How does he bankrupt it? Well, they come and help us fight the uh, American revolution because they don't like the English very much. The English are kind of like, uh, you know, they become the big enemies of France. And after the death of Louis XIV, especially, there's an ongoing series of wars between France and England for sort of like 
sort of like international dominance. Um, and England ends up winning those and becoming the most powerful uh, country in the world for a very long time. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of the stories of his wars. Um, and like I said, you know, keep in mind that, that, that specifics about wars, especially you don't need to know the wars. Um, and in this case, you know, you don't even really need to know the pieces. Um, again, I'm just double checking just to make sure that I'm right about this, but I don't believe that you need to know, um, any of the peace treaties that came out of any of Louis XIV's wars. So just focus on the big idea that the wars were his attempt to expand French power, but they ended up creating an international alliance against him and backing up and, and strengthening the idea of, um, of uh, the balance of power. So, yeah, I'm hoping that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's all good for helping on the test and stuff like this. Amanda is an international baccalaureate uh, student. Good. Um, the IB program has always been something I thought's pretty cool, um, especially because it is an international diploma. Um, sorry, I've been talking, so I really need to wet the old whistle here. And yes, in the true uh, European spirit, even though Italy is doing nothing at this point, San Pellegrino, the Italian sparkling in water. I have to tell you, after extensive travels in Europe, I really, really, really got there. Well, there you go, Gabby. I just answered the question. Um, I really, really, really got uh, uh, addicted to like sparkling water. There's just something to having water with a little like oomph to it. You know, but I'm going to be honest with you, I, I put this thing like in front of me when I'm teaching and people think, think not so much with these plastic bottles, but they make them in, in glass bottles, which look a lot like wine bottles. And people say like, what are you drinking? Well, it's just water. So don't worry. Um, but, uh, but it's very good water. I recommend you try it. Hey. Try a little European flavor. You can't get so much around here. So, mm. it's good stuff. All right, we've got about five more minutes here. Um, if anyone has a question, now is the time to ask. Otherwise, I'm going to start wrapping this whole thing up um, because there is a vice presidential debate going on. Now, before, you know, it, I'm waiting for questions here, so I will say this. Traditionally, um, in American politics, I know I'm getting off topic here, but traditionally in American politics, the vice presidential debate is a forum for vice presidents to be the attack dogs of the campaign because presidential candidates kind of have traditionally tended to take a little bit of the high road. I mean, they attack each other and all of that, but they hold back a, a, a little bit. And then they kind of let the vice presidents do the dirty work here. And so... So you get some really good sound bites out of vice president, vice presidential debates. I don't know how many of you watched the presidential debate. What was it last week? Um, but it got really ugly. So this is either going to be a flip flop and the vice presidential debate is going to be much more subdued with, uh, with, with Pence, Mike Pence trying to sort of like give, voters the idea that that there is really sense and sensibility to the campaign um, and Tim Kaine kind of maintaining and giving more credibility to sort of the sensibility of the campaign or it's going to get like sick ugly. So I don't know. I'm kind of excited to find out. So, I, I, you know, hopefully you'll do that. Um, yeah, yeah, Hillary is coming to Trump. There's definitely, and that's always happened, but there's a difference between creating an ad that that um, that attacks and like standing on a stage and getting all personal. Um, so yeah, my teacher Gabrielle mentioned briefly once about the Little Ice Age of cold and wet weather. Is that specific to France or is it a regional thing? The Little Ice Age actually hit most of Europe and it was a very short time, but it had very big effects because when you have even a lowering of temperatures for a short time, 
um, it shortens the the uh, the the, uh, the growing period, which means that less food actually is produced, um, and therefore it kind of cuts back on population growth. So it forces people into situations where they have to start making decisions about what to do, and this gets into like social history. So if you have less food out of result of the little ice age what do you start doing? Well, you can't grow more of it. Certainly, if you have land that you're not using, you would try to grow more of it, um, but you're only able to get so much. And so ultimately, what you end up doing is you end up making changes to your family patterns. And what you start seeing is you start seeing women marrying a little bit later. You see families trying to limit the number of children that they have because they just can't feed them all. Um, and so that, that messes with the populations that are seen in Europe um, and affects other things. In fact, there are those people, and, and Spivo kind of leads into this in his textbook, that, um, that some of the social changes that are going on because of, partially because of the Little Ice Age, um, give rise to the witchcraft uh, epidemic of the, uh, the 16th and 17th centuries, where you, know, you have these witches being accused and, and and burned at the stake and stuff like this um so there is yeah there is i mean climate can mess with things a lot look at the dust bowl during the great depression look at um the devastation that uh of, of hurricane katrina uh, you know that is fairly localized in those er in, in those things but when we talk about global warming and climate change you know if if uh, and I'm not a scientist and my numbers here may be wrong, but you know, I mean, if the, if the global temperatures go up just a couple of degrees, then it melts a lot of ice, which adds water into the oceans. And you know, what used to be like seaside property, it starts to disappear. I've seen some very scary animations of, you know, half of, uh, half of New York city going underwater because the, the ocean rises that much. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of really dangerous things that are going on there. So, um, I guess the only other thing just to mention in very brief is the, uh, use of art in, in this. These absolute monarchs use art as a way to enhance their power. Um, and Baroque art becomes the art of absolutism. The Baroque style is very ornate. There's a lot of like gold finery and gold leaf, um, lots of tiny little things, you know, little curly cues and all of this sticking out all over things. I mean, it, it, it's created uh, or, or, or it's used to create an emotional response of awe or an emotional response of, um, of uh, sort of just glorification of whatever it is. It's used by the church. It's used by the Catholic church. It's used by monarchs in order to show off how great they are. And, you know, the Baroque architecture of like Versailles is just kind of everywhere. Um, and, uh, and so Baroque art is, is like the art of the absolutist period. So you will need to know that there are Baroque artists that, that are mentioned, um, in the curriculum outline, um, including Rembrandt, El Greco, Bernini, Rubens, and Genelashi. So, um, you know, those are some things you can look up. Maybe we can talk about that next time. My students are going into a long weekend for Columbus Day, and we can argue whether Columbus deserves a day or not. That's a whole different topic, and maybe we bring that up next time. I don't know. But next Tuesday, I will be doing another uh, broadcast, and we'll still be in absolutism and constitutionalism. Um, so if you, uh, if you have more questions about it at that time, please feel free to ask. So until then, I have to give my plug. All right, please. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the comments. I appreciate the thanks. I'm glad all this is helping. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. 
Um, it's really simple. You just kind of click the button that says subscribe and like, bam, it's done. Um, but that shows you when new videos are posted and it gives you like a heads up when I'm doing uh, live videos, although you can pretty much count Tuesday night Eastern is when these are going to happen. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, yeah. And then look at the videos which are out there. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, you know, you see if they can help you. Um, my website has lots of, uh, lots of resources you can look at. If you want to follow me on Twitter, if you want to follow me on Instagram, um, you can, uh, you can subscribe there. There are links on my website. Um, and then I'll just leave you with a thought before I go. I put this out off the top of my head today. Um, I was thinking about making some t-shirts for AP Euro 2016. I was going to do them for my class, but I uh, don't know if other people would be interested. So, you know, I'm thinking something along the lines of, you know, I survived AP Euro, taking it bit by bit, something like that. So, uh, you know. Let me know if you're interested, if, if, if this is something that I should really pursue beyond my own classroom, um, if people would want them. Uh, and uh, if, if so, great. And if not, hey, I'm going to make them for my students and they can wear them around proudly. So it's 9 o'clock. I got to go. There's a VP debate coming on. Thank you so much for joining. Please don't forget to subscribe. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Have an enjoy your long weekend, and I will see you back here hopefully Tuesday night, eight o'clock next week. We'll do some more absolutism and constitutionalism, and maybe get a little bit into the scientific revolution. So, um, yeah, thanks so much. Have yourselves a wonderful night, and you guys are awesome. Thanks for all your support. Take care.